We're looking at our study of futures, and we're now uh, going into, I'm going to ask you to be patient with me, we are now going into what will be a two-part argument today and next Sunday uh, regarding the fact that, uh, what do we know for sure? We're asking a question, or maybe we're making a statement. You'll have to pick. Should we put a question mark at the end of that, or should we put an exclamation point at the end of that? But what do we know for sure? You could say, what do we know for sure is this? Or you could be asking the question in a very unstable and very deceiving age in which you and I are living in, what do we know for sure? Now, it all depends on how you place it and what it sounds like. So today we are going to be commencing a study that is going to incorporate uh, us uh, looking at or being conscious or aware of the fact that I believe from what I'm hearing and what I'm seeing that around the world people are turning their eyes toward God. All around the world right now, the conversation is people are talking about America. All around the world. And the news headlines prove it. All around the world, people are talking about Israel right now like never before and for good reason. And uh, all around the world right now, and has been the case, and it's increasing right now, the world is talking about war. God, America, Israel, and the specter of war. And we embarked upon this study that those of you who are new to this church or those of you that are visiting, waiting for your church to open up wherever you've come from, I get it. I want to take opportunity to grab a hold of you and give you some Bible prophecy. And in the words of our good old friend, uh, well, not old friend, he's, he's a good friend, Dr. Ed Heinsohn at Liberty University, remember what he says, I love it, God did not give us Bible prophecy to scare us, but to prepare us. And that's a great word. When you hear a teaching in this series, and whenever you read about Bible prophecy, and remember 27 to 33% of the Bible is prophetic in nature, it ought to bolster your faith, it ought to encourage you, it ought to get you excited, and what I love about it is, it ought to cause you uh, to have a very, very bold and firm foundation in the word that is hidden in your heart. This morning, we're going to do something a little bit different. I'm going to ask you to stand in reverence of the reading of God's word. You can stand. <laughs> the re- you do revere God's word, don't you? But I'm going to read it. I'm just going to ask you to follow along, look on, watch on, as uh, today we are going to be using uh, portions of the book of Ezekiel, chapter 38 because of the timeliness, and I'm going to really encourage you, don't miss next week, because that's when the bow is going to be put on top. I'm really taking a big risk right now, because I'm going to ask you to dive into this, and then realize that it's not going to be finished until next Sunday, unless you guys want to stay over for an additional two hours, and we can do the the whole, whole thing. I don't think second or third service would appreciate that much, but... I'm going to read this to you. You just look on if you would. Ezekiel chapter 38, beginning at verse 1. Now the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, turn and face Gog, G-O-G, of the land of Magog, the prince who rules over the nations of Meshach, Tubal, and prophesy against him. Him being a personal pronoun, is, by the way, Gog, G-O-G. Give him this message from the sovereign Lord. Gog, I am your enemy. That's not a good day. (laughs) I will turn you around and put hooks in your jaws to lead you out with your whole army, your horses and your charioteers in full armor and a great horde armed with shields and swords. Verse 5, Persia, or Iran today, Ethiopia and Libya will join you too with all their weapons. Gomer and all its armies will also join you along with the armies of Beth Togomar from the distant north and many others. Verse 7, get ready, be prepared. Keep all the armies around you mobilized. This is God speaking to this political military leader that goes by the title. Gog, G-O-G is a title. So God is admonishing him and exhorting him, you better be ready and you better be prepared. Keep all the armies around you mobilized and take command of them. A long time from now, so that was about 570 BC when this was written, you will be called into action 
In the distant future, you will swoop down on the land of Israel, which will be enjoying peace after recovering from war and desolation, a people who have returned from many nations to the mountains of Israel. You and all your allies, a vast and awesome army, will roll down on them like a storm and cover the land like a cloud. Thus says the Lord God, at that time evil thoughts will come to your mind and you will devise a wicked scheme. You will say Israel is unprotected, an unprotected land filled with unwalled villages. I will march against her and destroy these people who live in such confidence. I will go to those formerly desolate cities that are now filled with people who have returned from, listen to this, from exile from many nations. I will capture vast amounts of plunder, for the people are rich with livestock and other possessions now, a people who think they dwell in safety. But Sheba and Dedan and the merchants of Tarshish will ask, so this is God now speaking, Nations are going to say something. By the way, Sheba and Dedan is the dwelling region today of the landmass of Saudi Arabia. And the merchants, plural of Tarshish, would be the, the native uh, neighborhood of those that make up the Isles of Britain and Spain or the western states or nations. That's where that region of the world as Tarshish has always been. So this is a, a quite timely announcement. He says that Sheba and Dedan and the merchants of Tarshish will ask, do you really think the armies you have gathered can rob them of silver and gold? Do you think you can drive away their livestock and seize their goods and carry off plunder? By the way, that's all they do is that they fire, file a UN resolution. They just say it. They don't do anything about it. Therefore, son of man, prophesy against Gog. Give him this message from the sovereign Lord. When my people are living in peace in their land, the land of Israel, then you will arouse yourself and you will come from your homeland in the far distant north with your vast cavalry and, and mighty army. And you will attack my people Israel, covering the land like a cloud. At that time in the distant future, I will bring you against my land as everyone watches. And my holiness will be displayed by what happens to you next, O Gog. Then all the nations will know the word is awakened or become awakened to the fact that I am the Lord. Amen. Heavenly, yes, Heavenly Father, your word of power and truth. How awesome is this? We can uh, stop any Jew on the streets, anywhere in the world, and read to them from their prophet Ezekiel, asking them, has this ever happened before? And they all agree, that has never happened before. This is not some distant prophecy that was somehow performed in some typology or by some silly little play. This is your sovereign word spoken by the sovereign Lord, and it has yet to happen. And so God, show us the times and the age in which we live in, and how close this event on God's prophetic timeline really is. For we ask it in Jesus' name and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. You can be seated, church. You can be seated. <laughs> As we continue on in this overview of what the Bible teaches about future events, it is incredibly powerful to realize that when we open up the Bible, a book that the world, an unbelieving world, views as, as some old, dusty <laughs> book, that when it comes alive to them by its presentation through preaching and teaching, things happen. Something happens. I'm reminded of last week. I you cannot engineer this. You cannot explain this. How was it that last week that a child of 10 years of age hears the message, who I thought they would be in children's ministry, but mom and dad held them in here, they heard the message that was preached to you. They wanted to get saved at the end of the message and then also a man of some 71 years of age as well. How does that happen? There's no explanation for it but the power of God's word. You can't do that. You can't make that happen in business. You can't make that happen in some sort of 
marketing campaign? How do we sell this to 10-year-old kids and also 71-year-olds? I mean, isn't it obvious that when you watch TV commercials now, everything is about suing the people whose commercials talk you into taking their drugs? Have you noticed? Take our drugs. Take our drugs. Your elbow will feel better. Your head might fall off, but your elbow will feel better. <laughs> Read the fine print. And then you take it, you know, to stop a cough. You take their medicine, but then you go blind. And then they say, well, you, you're, you, you don't cough anymore, do you? No, I don't, but I went blind. Well, you said you didn't want to cough. You took our drugs. And then the next commercial is, have you experienced <laughs> severe Disablement from the me medications thus and so? Sue! One group says buy, and the next group says sue. And it's all about this dynamic of trying to reach. And notice, it's always an older culture. Not much culture on TV anymore reaches the young people. It's all about your elbow, and it's all about going to the bathroom. It's, an all, about, it's all about this other stuff. But the, listen, the world, the world is targeting those who've got the money or the insurance to do something about it. You know what Jesus does? Jesus targets all people, all who are searching. And he goes after the young. You know why? Because if they, if they yield their heart to Jesus Christ, he can spare them a lot of grief from this world. He gives them wisdom and guidance. Yes, let's be honest. Jesus said, do not forbid the little children to come to me because he loves them. God is talking about us living in the last days and how we are to identify the last days. And we can do that, church, without being flamboyant and bizarre about it. That's why God gave Bible prophecy. By the way, I'm a strong believer in this. I may be the only one who believes this, but I'm convinced of it, so don't try to talk me out of it. That if you understand true biblical prophecy in a, in a deep, conservative, theological sense, as you ought... That's why I'm a big fan of Dr. John Wolverid. He's in heaven now, but you ought to read everything he's written. You'll never get goofy if you read what he's written. Then I believe that you'll be galvanized against deception in the last days. If you know what Bible doctrine teaches, especially in the light of prophecy, because why? The Bible over and over again warns that in the last days, false prophets and false teachers are coming. And you can expose them if you know the truth. And the Bible says, and we read it a moment ago, that there's going to be this one called Gog. It's a remarkable word. We'll look at it both a little bit today and next week together. Gog, G-O-G. It is a title. It's not a person's name. It is a title. And the word in Hebrew means that whoever this person is, that he is a, a ruler of a nation, a nation, singular, he holds the power of both being the ruler of the nation in politics and at the same time, all of its military. It's different than the United States. We have a, a division, I think we still do, I'm not sure, a division of the halls or the channels of power. We have an executive branch, a legislative branch, and a judicial branch. By the way, that our founding fathers took out of the Old Testament where it's spoken there. And so we have that, but not all nations have that. And to give you an example, Russia is a nation that fits exactly right now with the definition of Gog. It means that it has a leader. He has absolute authority over the politics and the military. Complete. And that's a very important thing because it talks to us about him being the leader of a certain geographical area that in Genesis chapter 10 and 11, that's, that's, a note, that's a note you ought to write down or a reference you ought to write down in your note taking. How do you know for sure that what I'm going to be teaching you is right? Go to Genesis 10 and 11 and you're going to uh, learn about these names, the table of nations it's known, and you're going to see who and where these people dwell. This man rules over that people group. And oh, by the way, from Jerusalem. Uh, I don't want to make an assumption here. Do, you all need to know that when the Bible talks from Genesis to Revelation about geography, the Bible has what is known to the Bible, to the biblical reader, what is the center of the map or the center of the globe. The center of the globe is not in the middle. <laughs> the cent I know it's going to be hard for you to take. Listen, the center of the globe is not California. 
Look, it's not America. You know, you can always tell when you're buying a map that's made in the Western world, the United States is in the middle. It's funny, because when you go to the Middle East and buy a map, Israel's always in the middle. That is a biblical map. According to God, the center of this world is not only Israel, it's Jerusalem. So when the Bible says north, south, east, and west, it's from Jerusalem, always in the Bible. And if you, according to the scripture, it says here that this leader will bring his army from the far distant north, it, the word in Hebrew means he's going to bring an army from a region that is so far north, you can't go any further north. If you do, you're going to start going south. So you want to draw a line on your globe, on your map, uh, with a little piece of thread or yarn, put it on Jerusalem and go to either magnetic or true north, and it doesn't matter, you're gonna go through the last distant nation that's at the top, and it just happens to be today, this place called Russia. And uh, that's important, because uh, we'll see why in these next two weeks. So I wanna show you a map about that, maybe a couple of maps, maps as we look at this. So you see exactly that center map. According to the Bible, we're talking about this military political leader Gog, and uh, Ezekiel's going to go on to tell us, we'll probably touch on that more next week, that he is the prince of Rosh, right? Meshach and Tubal. And Rosh, Rosh, depends on how you pronounce it, don't think that scholars and Bible teachers assume that Rosh or Rosh sounds so much like Russia that it must be, that must be the meaning, and it's a default out of sloppy study. No, it's actually the location. It just so happens that in our modern world, Russia is the region, by the way, you guys ought to take, a, uh, take note of this. The Bible says that in the last days, two things are going to, many things, but two things would have to be a prerequisite to this battle taking place uh, in the Bible in Ezekiel 38. And number one is that Israel would have to be back in their land. Yes. Is that amazing? Yes. For those of you who don't know, uh, we'll, we'll be teaching more on this, but you might say, Israel, that's ridiculous. Of course, Israel. Hmm. Israel's the only nation ever in the history of man that was a nation, then it ceased to be a nation, and then all of its people came back to its land to become a nation a second time. No other country in the history of man has ever done that, and the Bible says that's exactly what would happen. And we're going to cover those scriptures in the next two weeks, so don't miss it. So this one is going to come out of, he is the commander, the chief, over this region of Rosh. Meshach and Tubal, and that region of Meshach and Tubal, next slide please, we'll kind of toggle back and forth, look at this, Meshach, Tubal, ancient tribal names of what is today uh, Russia, keep this in mind, so Israel had to be in the land, right, and Rosh, God in his goodness takes us back to its tribal meanings and locations, me, uh, what I mean to say is this, church, is that, do you remember a beloved California governor who became president said in Berlin, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. And little did that man know that his utterance was probably conducted by the Holy Spirit. Why? Because the prophecies of the Bible announced to us that it wouldn't be the Soviet Union that would come against Israel in the last days. It would have to be Russia. Interesting. That's very important. And these names, we'll learn about these names. You, you see um, these Names that are listed and given out, these are by scholars, these are by publication companies. Some of them debate some of these locations. Uh, for example, Sheba uh, and Dedan. You can see Dedan to the north, it's beige of Israel. Sheba uh, down to the south, you know it today as Saudi Arabia. You all know this, especially if you have any Iranian friends or neighbors. Uh, they will not let you get away with calling them Iranians. Oh, so, so, so where are you from? They'll tell you where they... Well, exactly, we're from Persia. What? Right. No, we're from Persia. 
You mean you're Iranian? No, we're Persians. They're very proud of that. And I would be too, by the way. If I was, a, if I was an Iranian, I would say, nope, I'm Persian. Because many of the Persians are not proud of their Iranian uh, nation that has been really something uh, since around and about 1979. Uh, no, they want to be Persians. And let's remember, when we talk about Persia, we're talking about a Bible land in the scripture, Persia. So you look at this map right now. You see Togomar, the house of Togomar, is predominantly the region of Turkey today and a little bit expansive in the sense that it slowly drifts up and fades away into what is Romania or Ukraine today, known as the regions of Gomer in the Bible. Remarkable things uh, mentioned here in Scripture. All of a sudden, the ancient past begins to come awake, come alive when God begins to move in Bible prophecy. And that which was old and dusty and confusing to us begins to uh, wake us up. And that's a very important truth. Jesus said regarding all things, remember, in John 14, 1, let not your heart be troubled. So when you're hearing this message, you should get excited. So I don't know if you should get excited. Look, with what's coming, you can either get run over by it, or you can understand that God has spoken to you about these things, and you can get excited about it. Because, by the way, it's a big difference. It's a big difference on how you understand or how you view Bible prophecy with this beautiful caveat built into it. It's a verse I think I've been using almost every week during this series. Luke 21, 36, Jesus says to us, Be always on the watch. Pray that you may escape all that is about to happen. And that you may be able to stand before the Son of Man. That is at his coming, his appearing. So church, listen, I'm going to ask you to write these down. I'm going to give you a string of verses, and we're going to get into our point. So are you ready? I need to know. Can you say, say repeat after me. I am ready. I am ready. Number one, Titus 2.13. This is all preparatory. Titus 2.13. Looking for the blessed hope. Every believer within the hearing of my voice, you are to be looking, scanning, observing, the horizon for what? The blessed hope. Let's see what it is. And the glorious appearing. I'll argue with you today that it is not the coming of Christ, but the appearing of Christ. Big difference. The appearing of our great God and Savior. It's one and the same. He's one and the same, I should say. Who is it? Jesus Christ. This verse keeps cult members up late at night. Because it screams about the fact that the Christian is to be watching constantly for his coming, which means there's no warning, per se, exactly. And then secondly, that he is the great God and Savior, because the Bible teaches there is no second or third. No wonder why Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father but through me. Why? Because he is our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. That's the great, great verse that you ought to have over you. Number two, listen to this. This is very, very much fun. I'm going to give you five references, each one from the five chapters of the book of Thessalonians. When Paul preached in Thessalonica, by the way, on one of those maps, I, I could have showed you where that is. Here's the thing, though. When Paul came preaching the gospel... He came into the region of Thessalonica, and scholars all agree that he was there somewhere between three to four weeks. That's it. He preached. There were no Christians. He preached. Pagans began to accept Christ. He set up a church, and he moved on. And three to four weeks later, or some time later, he writes them a letter, I should say. I think it was actually close to about a year. He writes a letter back to them because he heard that they were panicking that they had somehow missed the last day's events. Notice this with me, and I'm going to make it pretty, what's the word, demonstrative. I will really let you know. <laughs> Notice this, mark it down. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 10. Wait for his son from heaven. You are to be waiting. Whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus who delivers us from the wrath to come. You see the word wrath? You ought to circle that. And you ought to say, this is not talking about hell. This word has nothing to do with hell. This word has everything to do with God's wrath that's going to be poured out upon the earth 
for a Christ-rejecting age or world. You need to know that. It changes everything if you understand that. They were panicking and they were afraid and they thought they missed his appearing and that they were going to be going through the wrath and the judgment of God. And Paul tells them, nope. Or in Hebrew, it's lo, lo. I like that, lo. Yes is ken, ken. Lo, no. Paul, didn't we miss it? Lo. No, you didn't miss it. Keep looking, keep watching. 1 Thessalonians 2, 19. Chapter 2, verse 19. For what is our hope, says Paul, or joy or crown of rejoicing? Is it not even you in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at his coming or at his appearing? Chapter 3, verse 13. He says, so that he may establish your hearts blameless in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. How many of you know someone who died believing in Jesus? Raise your hand. They died believing in Jesus. They're coming back with him. That's the reference with all his saints. That's why you'll see in a moment, watch how this builds. It's going to explain what that means. What do you mean he's coming with all his saints? I thought you'd ask. Chapter 4, verse 13. But I do not want you to be ignorant or uninformed, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring, hello, with him those who sleep or died in Jesus. By the way, please remember, sleep is referring to their bodies, not their souls. There is no such thing in the Bible as soul sleep. That's a cultic view, and it's unbiblical. Verse 15, for this we say by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. Watch what happens, and this will prove the argument. What appears to be asleep? He's going to tell us. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and the trumpet of God. And here you go. The dead in Christ will rise first. Their bodies will pop up out of the grave. Pop up. <laughs> have you ever seen a, have you ever, have you ever bought a, I mean, you don't buy these things very often, but when you do, it's kind of cool. When you buy a new toaster, <laughs> when do you buy a new toaster? But like twice in a lifetime. One of the great attributes about a toaster is that when you put the toast in and you toast it for the first time, you better be ready. When that thing's done, that toast comes flying out of there. You can even grab it. In a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, that toast comes shooting out of that toaster. According to the Bible, listen, God is going to shout the voice of the archangel and the trumpet of God and boom, like a toaster. Forest lawn, think about it, Rose Hills. Wow, look at that. There's going to be all these Pop Tarts coming up. Amazing. The Bible tells us then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up, the word rapture, together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. That should be a great comfort. Listen, let's be honest. If you're a Christian, but you're, you're sleeping with bubbles or rocky, and God has been saying to you, you ought not to be doing this, or you're getting, you know, dabbling back into the old world of drugs, but now you believe in Christ, and Jesus is saying, come on, get out of that. We don't do that anymore. Or you're snooping around and looking in places you ought not to be looking, and the Holy Spirit says, you belong to me now. Stop it. You know what? Listen. What's, what ought to be very comforting is when we say, Jesus could come back today. You always see the Christian who's not walking right with God. They go like this. When you say, oh, man, I hope the Lord comes back today. And they go, yeah, okay, right on. Huh. Really? They're a little nervous about it. Hey, man, the Lord can come back today. The only time I see hesitation with that is at a wedding. Before I walk out here with the, with the groom-to-be, I said, man. Then it'd be great the Lord came back. Why are we halfway down the aisle? The Lord comes back. And he goes, oh, no. How about one more day? <laughs> it's great. It's always, it's always fantastic. But the person that is, the Christian not walking with God doesn't like to hear about this. But it's exactly what you need to hear. 
He could come back at any time. He wants you to love that hope also. And look, if you're not a Christian, you should just panic right now, right where you're at. I mean, we've got defibrillators and nurses and doctors all over this place. You ought to have a heart attack. You ought to just have a heart attack right now. Because if you knew that you're one breath away from eternity called hell, you'd shut me up. You'd get up here. You'd get on your knee. You'd say, get out of my way. Stop talking, Pastor. I need to get saved now before something happens. Think about that. It's exactly. And then 1 Thessalonians 5, 9. Five chapters, five exhortations about his imminent coming. For God did not appoint us to wrath. That is the wrath of Almighty God. His vengeance that's coming upon the earth. But to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. That's great news. And so in our current global situation, church, we see an awakening taking place. An awakening. I don't mean just spiritually. In all kinds of ways. This is how we know we're living in amazing days. When I say awakening, bear with me when I say Iran. Persia is awakening. China is awakening. North Korea at this hour is awakening. Russia is awakening. For the last four years, these players have been contained by large degree. You need to know that. So number one, we look at this. In light of all that's going on, and we're seeing saber rattling, we're seeing an awakening all of a sudden of nations. Listen, right now as I speak to you, what is today's date? 24th. The 24th. Mark your calendar. Look at Jane's Defense Weekly. Go to those websites. Go to some of these websites uh, Go to the website Proceedings by the U.S. Navy. Go to some of these websites and read some of the things that are going on. And you look around at the world, and all of a sudden, in the last seven days, there's been a bizarre global shift in the players I just mentioned to you a moment ago. They were all back... Like a lion tamer puts a lion back in its corner. They were like this. They weren't happy. They weren't going, oh, goody, look at America's economy. It's fantastic. Oh, look at all the people going to church. Isn't that great? They didn't do that. They were like this. And they were held in place. And then all of a sudden, things have been shaken. I'm talking about the hand of God. I'm not talking politics here. There's a reason for this. Number one, I want you to mark this down. What we know for sure is all eyes are on God. So that's a huge statement. All eyes are not on God. This is what I mean by this. People are awakening and they're asking questions about God and the end of the world and what's up next. There are atheists asking the question. People are jarred. In a recent poll, some 70% of Americans thought that we'd be at war within a year with Iran, Persia. Not because we want to, but because of what they're doing. Isaiah chapter 45, verse 21 says, Who has declared this from ancient time and who has told it from that time? Have I not I the Lord, that there is no other God beside me, a just God and a Savior? There is none besides me. Notice what he's saying. This is the result of that reality, that truth. Verse 22. Look to me and be saved, all you ends of the earth. For I am God and there is no other. In the midst of all the shaking that is now beginning to formulate and the posturing, it's God's will right now that the world wake up to these things and understand God's in control. He knows exactly what's going on. It's been said that recent events both in our nation and the world have revealed to us that we are all living in unprecedented time, that these times just might be with us for a while. Nobody wants to hear that. But they're starting to make comments. They're starting to say things. And I've got news articles that I may or may not get to this week, but certainly by next week. People are beginning to question everything, and so we should. People are unsettled. People are looking for answers. And that's what I mean by all eyes are upon God. The book of Haggai, chapter 2, verse 6 and 7 says... Haggai 2.6, this is what the Lord Almighty says. In a little while, I will once more shake the heavens and the earth, the sea and the dry land. Listen, 
He's not, he's not poetically speaking here. This is not God writing a, a play. He means it. I will shake all nations. And what is desired by all nations will come. That's the hope of the gospel. I will fill this house, speaking of his temple with glory, says the Lord Almighty. God knows what's going on in the nation's church. He knows what's going on. And there's a healthy and a much needed, I'm going to get mail for this. <laughs> there's a healthy and much needed division taking place in what is called church. It needs to happen. People groups, religions, this is necessary. It's increasing every week. We need to remember something that in Hebrews 12, 28, Hebrews 12, 28, the Bible says, therefore, since we've received a kingdom which cannot be shaken, isn't that great? Uh, let me interrupt myself right here, right now. The world is shaking. Some people are shaking. God says, wait, wait, come to me. Let me hold you. Let me hold you. You, you, don't, you don't need to shake your mind. Don't sh stop shaking. Our little dog, she never shakes, but for some reason last night, you know little dogs usually shake? She doesn't. Well, she was shaking. It's too cold for her. So you know what? The moment we picked her up and held her, about a, it had to be you know, a minute that she stopped shaking. She looked scared, but she was cold. There are people that are shaking today. They're Christians. They love the Lord. But doubt and fear has gotten into them, and they're shaking. And God is saying, come here, come here, come here, come here. It's funny because he's saying, come here. <laughs> and so you need to let him pick you up. And he says, listen, I'm going to take care of you because my kingdom will never shake. But he goes on in the passage, that verse in Hebrews, he goes on and he says this. Therefore, since we have received a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us have grace by which we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. Oh my goodness, godly fear is an awesome thing. Godly fear is godly awe. It's, it means awe. Beautiful. For our God is a consuming fire. It's the will of God that you come to the saving, loving, and forgiving knowledge of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. This is the will of God. All eyes on God. People are beginning to look, and so they should. Very important. I think we have a slide under this point. Is it number four, you guys? Is that what we're looking at? New York Times, May 15th. 1948, all eyes on God. People say, well, I don't know about all eyes on God. Whoa, whoa, wait, wait, wait. We've mentioned this before. We need to mention it again. Headlines, Saturday, May 15th, because Saturday, May 15th follows Friday, May 14th. <laughs> May 14th was the day that Bible prophecy was fulfilled. And the New York Times says, Zionists proclaim new state of Israel. Truman recognizes it, right? recognizes it and hopes for peace. Tel Aviv is bombed. Egypt orders an invasion. <laughs> Did you know that Israel was attacked one day after they were born? They had no army. But they won. How does that happen? God has done this. Absolutely amazing. You say, how does that play into anything? It plays into everything. Hear this loud and clear. In fact, modern day liberal theologians hear this loud and clear. Those of you who are embracing replacement theology, let me say this to that heresy. If God does not fulfill every promise he has made to the nation of Israel, then we Christians have no promises at all. He said his covenant with Israel was everlasting. He said, I will bring you back from the ends of the earth and place you in your own land once I begin to move. You saw the headline, evidence of a fact. People look at it, well, that's a nice headline. Are you kidding me? That's Bible prophecy fulfilled. We'll study it later, Isaiah 66. But that's a fact. Amen. You know what's awesome about that headline news? You can look at the New York Times on Saturday, May 15th, 1948, and say, isn't God good? And mm, Mm, my Bible's true. Because if God doesn't keep his promises to Israel, you ain't got nothing. 
How in the world would you expect to go to heaven? Well, Jesus promised me. You don't have any promises because if the Father can't keep them to Israel, then what responsibility does Jesus have to keep his promises to you? Thank God he keeps his promises to Israel and he shall keep them. Remember, we've been grafted in to what the Bible says is the commonwealth of Israel. We're going to go to heaven because the gospel came to Israel first. We need to remember that. All eyes are on God. John's gospel tells us, beautiful setting, amazing moment, by the way. In John chapter 4, verse 34, the Bible says there, and Jesus said to them, this is his disciples. Um, you know, Samaria, many of us have been to Samaria. It's not the safest place to be at today. It's, uh, it's under uh, Palestinian rule. It's beautiful, though, the region, the topography. So Jesus is walking along with his disciples, and it's time for them to eat. And so the disciples go off to buy food, and Jesus just stays there by himself. And the Bible tells us that a woman came from the city to get water in, in the middle of the day. So what does the Bible say that? I don't know if you guys know this or not. Respectable women got water in the early morning. If you were a prostitute, a hooker, or just didn't have a good reputation, you had to go in the middle of the day when it was hot and you were not seen with other women. The other women would not have you be seen with them. So this woman coming, she's, she has a reputation. And Jesus says to his, his disciples after this amazing event, because this is where he says to her that you, I have water to give you that if you knew, you'd be asking me for water. Because it's kind of a, I don't want to get off of this, but it's kind of a cute moment. Jesus is standing there and she comes by and she has her pot. And he says, can you give me a drink? Now that's a shocker. Because Jews are not allowed to talk to Samaritans. But Jesus was first God before he was a Jew. <laughs> and so he says, can you give me a drink? And she said, if you, if you knew. And obviously I'm paraphrasing right now. She said, why do you ask me for a drink? You're a Jew. And Jesus says, well, the truth is, in response to your question regarding worshiping God, if you knew who you were speaking to right now, you would ask me for a drink. And she goes, she goes like this. You have to get, you, have, you should look at my face on this one. You should look. Where she goes. She says, but you have no, you have nothing to draw water from the well, and it's deep. He's, she's, she's like, she doesn't know who he is. And he makes mention to her, why don't, you, why don't you go get your husband? And she goes, I don't have a husband. <laughs> and he says, oh, you're correct, you don't. You've, you've had four or five husbands, I forget the number, and the man you're living with right now is not your husband. And she just went, sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. <laughs> and she takes off and she goes and tells the Samaritan citizens, I found the Messiah. And so they all came out. The interesting thing about Samaritans is that they really, really maintained and wore white robes. So Jesus says to his disciples, they've come back and they're going, what's going on? And look what Jesus says to them. He says, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Do not say there are still four months and then the harvest comes. They were four months away from harvest. It wasn't the season for farming. So they're like, what? Jesus says, behold, I say to you, look. The word behold is look. So it's an active. Are you with me, everybody? Yeah. Look, you guys. Look, you 12. I say to you, lift up your eyes and look at the fields. For they are already white unto harvest. He gets them to look at Samaria that's located up on the hill. The well is down below. The, the, the citizens are walking out because this woman said, I found the Messiah. 
And they all came, and Jesus said, look at them coming. This is what paraphrase. Look at them coming. See all that white? I know it's still four months away before harvest. You're thinking earthly thoughts, guys. Look at that. Get out your, guys, get out your nets. These people want to be saved. Look at them coming. He's saying that today. This is what's happening now. Never in the history of Calvary Chapel, never in our history for sure, have we ever had a Saturday morning where you baptize over a thousand people. What's going on? It's not us and it's not anything that we've planned. We're a bunch of bumbling followers of Jesus. It's that he's moving. God is moving and he's moving in the earth. And can you not sense a great, a great race, as it were? There's a great race of evil and there's a great race. And don't you sense it? we got to hurry up. Listen, I don't have any promise as to how long I'll be able to keep preaching. And I want to hope, I hope I'm sensitive to the spirit enough for Jack to say, or for him to say to Jack, Jack, you know what? The fields are wide under harvest. Forget about Sundays. Do Sundays and do Mondays, Tuesdays, Wednesdays, Thursdays, Fridays. Get out there, get out there, get out there. The fields are wide. People around you need Christ. All of those that you live with and work with, they need Jesus. Remarkable. Number two, if all eyes, number one, are on God, number two is this, is the fact that I believe it's clear now that all eyes are off America. Off of America. And I believe this has to be. I'm not sure, but if there's ever been a time like you and I are living right now, in fact, I'm pretty confident there is, have never been a time like this where the United States in 10 months time went from the pinnacle of power, success, freedom, to the case of crippling fear, debilitating confusion, the loss of liberty and freedom in such short time. It's as though we were invaded by a foreign army. We have surrendered. We have given up. At the first hint or smell of battle, we folded. We failed to discern the times and the seasons in which we live and which our nation was gasping for air. In America, as we know it, is no more. I am not going to divulge who wrote me this. I'm just going to read it to you. This is in light of the Biden administration announcing Friday that the military troops in Washington will not be going home. They will be remaining in position until March. They'll be updated. We will be updated. Did you know that? This is from a congressman to me personally. The initial disproportionate D.C. troop presence served multiple purposes. The desired appearance of a military police state designed to induce fear into a resisting populace. And second, to display administrative no-nonsense willingness to use military powers against its citizens. Now retaining well over a th now retaining thousands of troops in DC, this will continue as the message. During the next few months, the administration intends to pass, declare and implement one anti-democratic transformational decision after another. The one party state isn't kidding around. They are swiftly using their unchecked power to their advantage. They will first ensure future elections will present no threat to their power base. By then, they will have recreated the U.S. into a docile, compliant member of the globalist state. That is what Biden's campaign theme means when said, build back better. The basis of American government, ruled by the consent of the governed, will have been rendered a dinosaur, while the rule of law will have little effect protecting individual liberties. Are we not watching this? Twitter, Facebook, Google, government, courts. Chief among these casualties was the loss of rule by the consent of the governed. 
because the people were given little to no true audit of 2020 voting integrity, recounting illegal ballots does not equal voting integrity. Next, censorship of individual speech by corporate media and political interest. Justice is denied today and was denied to hundreds of millions of Americans in the 2020 election. This began with algorithms from social media globalist conglomerates. Our government did nothing to protect us from the basic trampling upon of America's unalienable rights. It may be too late for a restoration of American freedoms. The Lord of Heaven's army may have rendered judgment upon our unrepented, sin-sick nation. As the current one-party state was elected by the corrupt alliance between one political party and corporate global behemoths, however, there is always a response that pleases and moves the heart of our living Savior. It is surrender. As we surrender our all to Jesus, we find new joy, new hope, and we live. That's from, a, that's from a politician. So I don't want to hear that. I understand that. But Bible, teaching, prophecy, America must go away. Did you know that? America cannot stand as we've known it. America's at this moment leaderless. National policy has been exchanged for socialism. Human rights, number one prevailing argument now, the gay agenda. The Constitution is now being declared a living document. You know when there's a living document, you can change it. That's what that means. God bless America. We better not say that anymore. Because I'm going to ask you back, what God are you talking about? I want to show you something. The uh, video guys on the screen, I believe it is. We ask it in the name of the monotheistic God, Brahma, and God known by many names, by many different faiths. It's hard to hear. A man and a woman. Wait, let's rewind it. I'm gonna rewind that. It's, 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 hard, it's hard to hear him. In the name of the monotheistic God, okay, st Brahma. Can, can you stop? In the name of the monotheistic God. Listen, first of all, you worship the monotheistic God, but with a capital G. You and I worship one God. I don't know if you caught this or not. If he's talking about the monotheistic God, there's only one. His name is Yah or Yahweh. This guy just took the name of God and committed one of the most high-handed treasonous acts against the God of heaven. Listen, rewind it again, you guys, and listen carefully. You're going to hear him call the God of the Bible Brahma. I'll explain Brahma. We ask it in the name of the monotheistic God, Brahma, and God known by many names, by many different faiths. A man and a woman. The God known by many different faiths. That's not true. No. That's not true. Ask, listen, Brahma's the birth, Brahma is the creator of Hinduism. Yeah. This guy, nobody who check, nobody's checking this. This is the man. I had the high honor of standing right where he's at one day. I got to open up Congress just like he did one time. I was terrified. I was terrified about fumbling God's name, fumbling. I was terrified. He stands there and he says an absolute theological uh, impossibility. Hinduism is not monotheistic. He doesn't know what he's talking about. Did the pastor at Calvary Chapel say that that guy doesn't know what he's talking about? Read my lips. That guy does not know what he's talking about. Brahma is not Yehovah. Brahma is not Yahweh of the Bible. It's at the name 
of Jesus, the Bible says, that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. You say, what's your point? My point is eyes, all eyes off America because America has jettisoned God for decades and God has left the building. He's finally left. He's out. He's gone. Ichabod is written across it. When our government now says, in God we trust, you don't know who they're talking about. And I'm not making any of this up. It's absolutely amazing to me. This is Brahma. This is the current God that apparently will be presiding over and protecting America for the next four years, I guess. Huh? This is it. That's it. It's so unable to do what you need it to do that you've got to bring flowers and put it in its hands. You've got to maintain it and take care of it. It's got to be crafted with multi-faces to convince you that somehow this thing sees all when the God of the Bible is omnipresent, omniscient, omnipotent, and spirit. If you think that I'm being harsh right now, we're all eyes off America, then let me ask you this. Do our leaders today approve of the fact of me, you, us praying publicly in the name of Jesus? No. Do our current leaders today allow us to say, speak, freely preach and teach the Bible without censorship? They are endorsing the new gods that manage social media worlds. There's a handful of men, four I think total, maybe five at the most, four for sure, who are basically running the world. And they have the power to shut down any leader around the world that says anything about them. Isn't it funny? I, I quit Twitter... And that's fine. I was going to get thrown off eventually anyway. But I quit Twitter. So uh, no word from Twitter on that. I just quit Twitter and I didn't expect to hear a word back. But someone has recreated me. And they're ripping off thousands of people all over the globe being me. I'm saying all kinds of things. You can't tell it's not me. So when we raise the issue this week to Twitter, Twitter says... We don't, we don't edit parody. We, we've concluded that them mimicking you, Jack, is parody, and we're not going to remove it. You can't believe anything on social media. People are saying, I can't believe you said this, and I have no way of commenting back. And this guy is me. This guy took my photos. He's... He's took the, uh, the, uh, the followers and he's talking to them. And Twitter says, that's just fine with us. They can govern the world when they control communication. America, all eyes off America. The fact of the matter is we have lost our position. I can't believe what time it is. There's no way that that's what the clock says. Listen, I'm going to finish this in seven minutes. Lord, you have seven minutes to come and get... No, I'm kidding. <laughs> psalm chapter 2, verse 4. Sorry, I'm going to give you this psalm. Made me feel better at the time. Makes me feel better even now. Psalm chapter 2, verses 4 and 5. He who sits in the heavens shall laugh. Can you imagine? God's laughing at Mark Zuckerberg. God is laughing at Dorsey. He's laughing at Bill Gates. Bill Gates thinks he's managing the world. Yeah. And God's going. <laughs> God laughs. He, he who sits in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall hold them in derision. Then he shall speak to them in his wrath and distress them in his deep displeasure. God's not happy. That's why judgment's coming. I believe, I believe America's in a state of judgment now. Everything about it smells judgment. National judgment, not you. National judgment, which God owes to nations, and he owes to America. 
Persecution is coming. It's already started. It is my heart's desire. We're working right now, trying to gather. I'll just let the cat out of the bag right now. One of our brother pastors in San Jose, California, Mike McClure, is standing for the truth. He's been sued by the county. He's, uh, he's been, uh, last week, he just escaped jail time for preaching the gospel in San Jose. The Silicon Giants hate him. And they want him destroyed. He's the only church standing. And he's, I think they're approaching close, I don't know, the hundreds of thousands of dollars in fines for being open in America. God's eyes are off America. The world may be looking at us, watching us sink. God's eyes are off. And so you can pray, please, and get the word out. I'm going to send out a note to our Calvary Chapel brothers across the United States, pastors of, the, of their churches, and if all of us pitched in, we can help them get out of their situation. If we pitched in, listen, not only prayer, but they're going to need money, and we're going to help them if nobody else does. But listen, the truth of the matter is, we need to stand for one another because our freedoms are gone. I told Charlie Kirk off camera, you don't know this part. He was saying a comment before he came out last Thursday night. And I said, Charlie, you're making me laugh. He said, what are you talking about? I said, you're talking like a, you're talking like an old school American, man. He goes, what do you mean? I said, you just cited like three reasons why the constitution would do this for us. I said, I think it bled out. I think it bled out recently and we just woke up to it. You don't have first amendment rights anymore. We will preach the gospel, we will stand, but we live in an age of persecution. But always persecution backfires because salvation sweeps cities, counties, states, and nations when this takes place. Next slide, you guys. U.S. decline of Christianity continues at rapid pace, is the headlines there. A Pew Form analysis shows you. By the way, I'd love for you to Google this. This was October 17th, 2019. If you Googled that for your own, this page is huge with Pew Research data as to what's going on. But the beautiful thing about it is you can turn that whole page upside down regarding us. Flip the numbers. <laughs> Where the Word of God is being taught and not apologized for, when people have the opportunity to be adults and live their life with the fear of God rather than the fear of government, a church explodes. So that data doesn't apply to us. You want to know why? There's a revival taking place here. You're going to leave in a moment and a whole new church is going to come to second service. The place will be packed out. And then they're going to leave and a whole new church is going to come to third service and it's going to pack out. Why? Because God's on the move. Listen, you and I may not have America anymore, but we've got God. We've got Jesus Christ. I want to leave you with this, and I'm, I am ending. Just let this watch over you. Luke 12, 35, Jesus says, let your waist be girded. It means get ready. And your lamps burning. And you yourselves be like men who wait for their master. Blessed are those servants whom the master, when he comes, will find them watching. Therefore, you also be ready, for the Son of Man is coming in an hour that you do not expect. Isn't that awesome? Yes. Revelation 22, verse 7, Jesus said, Behold, I'm coming quickly. Blessed is he who keeps the words of the prophecy of this book. Amen. Revelation 22, 12, Jesus said, and behold, I'm coming quickly, and my reward is with me to give to everyone according to this or to his work. Revelation 22:20. 20, Jesus said, surely I am coming quickly. He's coming. Internationally, the missionary window is closing. It's almost shut. But God is opening up other doors. That also is an indicator that we are in such remarkable short days. These things must come, but know this. That text I got from that congressman, things that we're seeing in our nation and the new God that presides over America. 
If you believe in a living, true, eternal God, he doesn't sit idle. And no nation on earth has been as blessed as this nation. We owed him our thanks and praise and our obedience. We have failed him as a nation. And it's time now, as the prophet said, to reap the whirlwind. That doesn't have to be true for you personally. God judges the sins of nations. But if you're a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, your sin was judged at the cross. See, when he comes back, he comes back as the conquering king over the nations. You've already settled your issue with him because you received him first as savior. Today, I want to ask you spiritually as we end. In fact, you can stand. I want to ask you this in a, in a spiritual sense. If today... you could be seen in the spirit realm. When angels look at you, what do they see? Do they see you personally marked by the salvation of God? As it were in the crowd, does, does an angel or angels or demons or devils looking down, do they see you marked with the protective seal of God's salvation in Christ Jesus? If some of you are not sure, you need to change that now. This word will never fail. You need to make sure that your life is right with God because our dear friends, you've heard it a thousand times here. The answer is not in the state house or in the White House. The answer is in God's house. And you need to hear this answer that's in God's house. Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. He died on the cross for your sins personally. He rose again from the dead to justify you because he loves you. And he loves you even if you don't love him. He still loves you. But don't, don't let the clock run out on that kind of twisted relationship. Don't let it run out. Love him. Return such love by surrendering your life to him. Well, hey, thanks for listening, and uh, we appreciate you. And of course we do in this time and in this age. Us being together and linking up together to get the Word of God out is actually ministry being fulfilled. And in fact, if you would like to subscribe, please do so. Hit the subscribe button. Tell your friends about us. And listen, if you'd like to help us get this out on a broader scale, you can support us by hitting on the Give Now button. And look, we're going to continue on with or without you. We're inviting you to join us. No pressure. But if you'd like to link arms in this venture, you'd be greatly appreciated. So listen, keep praying for us. We're praying for you. God bless you. And we'll see you back here real soon.